You're listening to the Big Three of B2B Leadership Podcast with Mike Faherty, where world-class business leaders share their secrets for personal, organizational, and market growth. Gain powerful insights from industry leaders that have been tested by the fire. Welcome to the Big Three of B2B Leadership, where we invite industry leaders to share their insights on personal and professional development, developing and maintaining operational excellence in an organization, and of course, expanding your company's position in the marketplace. My name is Mike Faraday. I'm your host. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Carl Mayer. Uh, I'm sorry, Meyer. (laughs) I knew I was going to do that. Carl is the founder of Abundant, a software-based management system designed to provide the structure that enables fast and consistent growth in in companies. Um, I'm excited to talk to Carl today about how business operations function can actually drive business growth. I think it's a really interesting concept. He's got tons of experience and really looking forward to this call. Welcome, Carl. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Mike. Excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about goofing the name. We talked about it. And then I I said the exact opposite of what uh, what you said. That's memorable. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that. Well, look, um, you know, uh, you know, every... Uh, you know, your journey to a software company. So you obviously, as I mentioned, you own a software company, uh, Abundant. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to start with just talking a little bit about your journey to owning a software company and being a software company founder. Uh, it was an interesting one, as I understand, you know, you were studying economics at Rice as an undergraduate. And when you were studying economics, what did you think you were going to be doing at this stage in your life? Well, that's a good question. That was a good question. I've, I've, you know, back in the day, you know, working for a big company was kind of the the general, you know, most common career path. I do have some um, entrepreneurial background in my family. So I also had considered the idea of, you know, starting a business at some point. Um, but yeah, then when I went on to get my, went straight through into my MBA and I concentrated in information systems, as well as entrepreneurship. So, you know, the the idea had crossed my mind at that point, but I ended up um, going into the corporate world, started with a, you know, big consulting accounting firm and in their consulting group and um, did corporate for a while, got hired away by one of our clients and um, see, you know, then, but then I did get pulled into my family's business. They twisted my arm till I kind of said, okay, I'll, I'll join the family company and did that for five years. But after that is when the dot com was taken off and, you know, and that's where it is. And so that's when I started my first software company. So that's really, I guess, the journey of how I got, you know, into making software to sell to other people. So that first software company, what kind of software was it? It was a B2B marketplace. We we, uh, helped buyers of industrial products connect with sellers of industrial products. And so our second round of funding was scheduled to close the month after the dot-com crash. So that never happened. So (laughs) (laughs) that was a tumultuous time. There was there was a lot of people that had figured out you know, or took a lot of ideas uh, to the internet. Um, some of them probably shouldn't have been there, but um, certainly marketplaces was a, you were maybe a little bit ahead of your time. Marketplaces had, wasn't a huge concept yet. I guess we had things like eBay and things going on, but um, niche marketplaces, I think that was a relatively new idea. Yeah. Um, that's cool. That's cool. So, so you, you told a little bit about your background. Um, and so, you know, why don't you just share just generally a little bit about Abundant so we have an idea of kind of what you're working on now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, after founding that first software company, I did found another, but uh, also worked with a number of different companies, different roles of the last 20 years um, in the lower middle market, companies under 100 people generally, and help them, you know, operations, help them with growth, um, and not so much on the sales and development, but helping them get organized and handle the growth that they were experiencing. 
And so eventually I realized that, you know, kind of time after time, I was using the same spreadsheets, and same PDFs. And it's like, why don't, you know, we put this into software and then can share it more easily and, um, you know, use all the, the tools that I've been working with with these companies. And so that's what we did. That's great. And so who do you, um, who is best, um, the best fit for Abundant as a software company? Like, so what, who are your ideal clients? So the ideal client is a company, you know, typically it's going to have, you know, we'd say between seven and 70 people is where, you know, the companies tend to fall and they're at the stage they want to be more organized, but maybe they don't want to pay a big consulting firm, you know, some big name group to, you know, the price of a, a decent car to, you know, have this consulting fee. They say, I like the idea, you know, I've read some books, I want to do it myself. Abundant software and some of our technical support um, can be an extremely cost-effective way for people that want to have that structure, want to have a business operating system, but we kind of want to do it themselves and say, hey, but that, why not use software, use apps and tools and software for everything else and, you know, accounting, CRM. So why not use it for my business operating system? Yeah, that's great. I, I love the term business operating system because it, um, in a lot of ways, it, it is a gap for, for most businesses that it's a um, it's most of the time it's in the founder or, or CEO's head, right? It's just the way that they want to um, function, right? And, and not all of them come with the same level of experience or expertise in that, in that area, but everyone still looks to them to say, you know, how do you want to operate this business? How do you want it to be organized and how do you want people to communicate? And so, um, the idea of giving them a, 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 a platform that gives them some structure to that, I think is really exciting. What, what are some of the core operational elements that businesses, you think businesses need to master as it relates to um, operations and growth? Right. To me, one of the key things that happens, you know, you start a company, you really know your service, your product, and you've got a couple people and you're very hands on and that's fantastic. And you're really able to add value to your customers. And all of a sudden you're growing and you're growing and, you know, you kind of look around and you realize, you know, you've got whatever, 15 or 30 or however many people and you're still doing things the same way as when you had two or three and now, you know, one, you're, you're probably feeling overwhelmed. You know, it's like I got a thousand things to do and 20 people asking me questions and, you know, ah, you know, <laughs> I need a I need a break. When do I get a vacation? And then the next thing that you realize is because you're so busy, you've kind of become a bottleneck and maybe you're, you know, it's causing your sales to not be able to grow as much. And so what you really need to do is have a big change in how you manage your organization. You know, it's now not about doing it hands-on and making this, the decisions. It's now about building the infrastructure and delegating so that you can you know, kind of really do that CEO role and not the hands-on manager role. That's a huge transition. But when you make that, then you enable the organization to grow to a whole nother level. And, you know, that's the situation we, we you know, my experiences with is helping companies that kind of gotten to that point, they've gotten stuck. You know, we build that infrastructure, help them move to the kind of new way of doing things. And then a number of times we've seen companies double their sales in two years, three years, and, you know, just have that next degree of success. So, so let's talk about that part of it. Um, you know, what, what are, can you talk just a little bit more and go into a little bit more detail about what are some of the, what are some of the drivers to business growth that come out of just operating a business better? How does that translate into increased revenue? Right. That's a good question. Cause it's, 
it really isn't super obvious, is it? Well, uh, I, I, let me let me ask you another way or just add another point to that, because when we think about. And I'd like you to address this. So when you think about when we think about operational excellence, most of the time we think about the bottom line. Right. We think about, oh, well, this is the way to get we've got X revenue and we've got Y profit. Right. So if we improve the operations of the business, we can increase you know, the profit by some percentage. But what you're talking about is both. Right. I want to improve the profit, but I also want to improve the top line revenue. Right. And so so that's the part I'm really interested in. So just talk a little bit about that part. Right. And maybe, maybe kind of just uh, use a story as a way to talk about that. Yeah. Um, had a company, they, uh, they're two, you know, some partners, uh, own the business and been, been in business for a long time. And they came to me and they said, Hey, our sales have been stuck. We've had basically the same sales for three years in a row. And, you know, we're in a big market. We should be able to, to grow. We give, you know, we feel like we give good service. And so it went in and, you know, it, it took six months to do, but, you know, we started looking at what the people were doing and, you know, we had people that weren't doing things that they were really good at, you know, and it just kind of a is historical, well, you know, they started doing that and they're still doing it. And, you know, so by kind of moving some people around and now they're, they're doing things that they love and they're better at, and you've kind of moved some of those other tasks to people that are are better at now that helps both you know it helps a number of things it helps your motivation for your people you know it changes their attitude and it also improves productivity and so when you put all that together you know how can you not improve kind of the customer experience so by helping the customer experience we're able to retain people you know customers better we're able to you know cross-sell customers more easily. And now when we bring in a, a new client, we're able to keep them longer. And so even that same flow of customers coming in, if we keep them longer, just sales just naturally grows. It's not that we're become a more effective sales company. It's we've become a more effective operating company. So we've, you know, it's easier to say, well, I'll buy one more of whatever you're selling, you know, if it's, you know, a staffing company or if it's a marketing company, you know, or, you know, a widget company, we're selling books, you know, well, I'll buy one more book from those people because it's easier to deal with them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I, I, I love that. The idea of it's got to be exciting for a, you know, a CEO or a business leader, business owner that's listening to this going, who, who really sort of isn't a big fan of sales and marketing. And there's a lot of them out there, especially in the, in the technology side. A lot of times your businesses are founded by technical experts, right? They have some specific technical expertise and that doesn't necessarily have to be technology, right? That could be a plumbing company. It's very often founded by a plumber, right? They were a really good plumber. They decided they start a plumbing company, right? And so they have some technical expertise that they bring to the business. And that's really where the, the genesis is but they maybe spent little or no time on the sales and marketing side and, um, and sort of in their nature, it's been my experience, at least in their nature, sometimes they're just generally skeptical and suspicious of the whole thing. Um, and, and so the idea that, hey, look, I could be with just a basic level of, of proficiency in sales and marketing and acquiring customers, I can expand my business by just being a better company, which sounds better to me and seems like makes more sense to those types of um, business owners who are kind of come to approach the problem from a technical expertise standpoint. I just think mm -hmm. that's really, really fascinating because a lot of them, you know, are going to, a lot of business leaders, CEOs, owners are, they're, they find themselves in this cycle of chasing the next best marketing idea like what what am i supposed to be doing now right what's the what's the what social platform am i supposed to be on i've got some you know marketing coordinator on my team it says look you know you got to start making tiktok videos it just they're suspicious of the whole thing like is that really going to work and is that really what our customers want and and that's 
look, I own a marketing agency. I think everyone, <laughs> anyone who listens to this knows that. So I'm a big fan of growing the top line through, you know, you know, positioning yourself in the marketplace in the most efficient way possible and, um, and making more people aware of you and, and solving problems. But um, this idea of if I, if I just get a customer to spend a little bit more with me because the experience is so good and the offering is so solid or get that customer to stay longer because, you know, the experience is great and the, and the offering is exactly is what I needed um, and you're solving my problem that I can actually get top line growth from those two approaches. Uh, a lot of times people just don't miss it, right? They think the only way they grow a business is through new customer acquisition. Right. We know, and we know there are only three ways to do it. Acquire more customers, get them to spend a little bit more or keep them for longer. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way to grow it. So uh, you're really addressing some of those last two areas, which a lot of people sort of dismiss and they go straight for new customer acquisition. Yeah. And, you know, it, clearly you can do a lot with those, you know, keeping customers longer and cross selling or, you know, selling a little bit more to each one. But if you've got the capacity, you know, and different businesses work differently, some are much more a one time sale. You know, if you're a, you know, an MA company, you know, you've sold their company and they're, probably not going to come back with a whole lot of other software. You know, they may refer business to you and doing a good job might help referrals, but you know, every company needs to find the right balance where they are bringing in new customers and devoting the appropriate resources to that. But the situation that I often find is that you get to a point and if you don't have the machine working kind of behind the scenes well enough it doesn't matter how many new widget, you know, new customers you bring in to sell them a widget. If you don't have the capacity to handle that new sales volume, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you end up just disappointing the customer, which is you lose revenue and you know you lose some brand equity or goodwill in the marketplace, and those are both mm -hmm. bad bad things, right? Right. So what, you know, in today's climate. Um, and today's a unique business climate. We're coming out of COVID, if you will. Uh, I think most of us agree that's kind of where we are. That we're kind of moving through that and past that. But now we're moving into this sort of inflationary period of time. Um, it appears, you know, that's what certainly the the you know tea leaves are suggesting. That's where we're headed. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge that B two B companies are going to face today? in this sort of dynamic? What are, what are the things that you see B2B companies dealing with or struggling with right now that ha might have the biggest impact on either, you know, growing the business or saving the business? Right. You know, I think over the last few years, we've seen a huge supply chain disruption. Um, you know, I'm hearing about a lot of uh, things moving back on shore, steel production, chips, and, you know, kind of a combination of that with baby boomers retiring, changes in immigration patterns, all sorts of different things have really created a, a labor shortage, you know, um, and there's all sorts of, you know, debates and different information about, you know, exactly how big that is. But if, you know, all the companies I'm working with are seeing it's harder to get employees, you know, new employees, they're, they're seeing uh, employees poach, the prices they're having to pay has gone up dramatically. Um, you know, one company with uh, manual, you know, kind of lower end labor, they're folding laundry, you know, I've seen like a 50% increase in their wage cost for those people. You know, it's, it's very significant. So I, I see that as one of the biggest challenges for companies, you know, and as a result, the more a company can make their place of work feel like a good place to work, the you know that's become a bigger competitive advantage than it was you know ten or twenty, even three years ago. You know, I, you know when I got out of school, it's like you want a job. Well, you know you work hard and 
will let you have a job. You know, now it's a lot more of, hey, wouldn't you like to work here? We're a great place to work. It's like, wow, that's just a world different. Yeah, I heard something yesterday and, and I, I wrote it down because I, I love the sort of the simplicity of it. It said, and it gets to the kind of where we were and maybe it's funny, I don't know if it's even relevant anymore. They said, uh, the best way, if you have a lousy job that you really don't like, the best way um, to to move past that or through that is to you know do that job as well as you possibly can. That's the shortest path to getting a job that's just a little less lousy. And you know, I thought about it, and that was certainly what I learned. You know, um, you know, when I entered the workforce, was hey, just put your nose down and do as good a job as you possibly can, and opportunities will present themselves because you're gonna stand out amongst your peers as, as someone who works hard and does good work, right? And I wonder in today's world, it's it seems very different that, you know, people who are younger and, and, or earlier in their career, let's say, that it, it's not, that's not the model anymore. That's not the paradigm. The paradigm is, you know, you know, learn what you need to learn, but increase your skill set and then just go, go, There'll be a number of people who are ready and want you and do, well, they'll give you a promotion. They'll give you more money. They'll give you more responsibility if you can just demonstrate some modicum of, of capability. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a just a really different thing. It's a really different thing. And I, yeah. I, I know you and I both have, you know, you know, kids who are sort of, you know, on the verge or, <laughs> you know, or just now entering uh, the workforce and it's uh I just think it's gonna. My advice. I wonder if if it's really gonna make sense anymore. Um, <laughs> maybe there needs to be a different type of advice. <laughs> right. I, I think it's uh, in my mind. It's still probably really good advice, but I have a sense that uh, the market won't uh, enforce it <laughs> quite as much as uh, when when we were coming out of school. So yeah. Well, I think they'll just see their peers getting ahead faster and saying, "Well, I'm wait. I'm I may be." A higher performer than that person but they just you know they they went out and found something and hustled their way into a, a more responsibility and maybe they're moving faster than i am maybe i need to try a different approach <laughs> you know it, internally it's oftentimes the slowest path but it can you know it can be the most rewarding path you know mm -hmm. that's a good point growing internally with the company but you know it the everything changes Right. And so the last thing I want to be is a dinosaur and says <laughs> the way my day, <laughs> this is how we did right. it. Yeah. So, That's the key. Get yeah. Down. You know, I've, I've, I've watched a video that you have put out recently, and um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about, about this idea of perfection is the enemy of done and, and your sort of thinking on incremental improvement. Because I think it's really interesting. And I, I know as a, as a business owner, Man, I, I really relate to this idea of, you know, go from zero to perfection or it's not worth doing. Can you talk a little bit about that idea? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, perfection, if, I mean, it's really a lot of what we've been trained for. If we take a test as a kid, did you get 100? Right? That's perfection. You know, I, I got all the answers correct. You know, when you get out of school, though, a lot of times it's, you know, well, wait, what is the question? You know, um, you know, what is the problem the customer actually has? You know, what problem do they want solved? Or if I'm an employee, you know, what problem does the boss actually have? Do they want me to do this task or do they want me to solve this problem? So, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what you're actually doing that, you know, growing up in school, we're taught, you know, no, it's all straightforward, it's all linear, and mm -hmm. it, it's not that way. And so, you know, I look at like a Toyota, you know, when Toyota, you know, back in the 50s and 60s was making cars, they were not the high end, highest quality car, but they were continually improving, continually make it a little better, a little better. And fast forward to, you know, now Lexus is the, the gold standard for quality. And, you know, that's uh, in Toyota itself is not far behind. 
And so that is what I see, you know, one part of it is. And the other is just, you know, I'll see like a, you know, a really well, you know, highly educated, very competent person trying to get something done. And they won't say, you know, they won't send it out until it's perfect. And it just takes so long and the world moves so fast that it's like, man, I, if you'd given me 80%, you know, a week ago, I'd be in great shape. And, you know, next time you'll do it even better. And so that's what I'm looking for is how do I keep, you know, find the balance between getting it out and getting it perfect. Yeah. I, I, I totally relate to that. I, I, I don't know how many times I start a project. I'm like, well, or, or I don't start a project, which is probably more common than I'm like, well, I don't have the time to make this perfect right now. So I'll just, I'm not even going to start. I'm just not going to spend any time on that. I'll look for something else to do that I think is going to be, you know, make me feel productive, which is also a whole different problem is what makes me feel productive and what is actually productive or sometimes really different things. But I totally relate to that idea that like, if I can't do it, if I can't do it perfectly and I don't want to do, if I can't be the best at it, then I'll just wait until I have time to do it. Cause I know I have the ability or whatever to make that thing great. Um, good enough just doesn't, just doesn't cut it at times. And so that, you know, that, that creates a problem. You know, it, it's almost like that, um, that idea that, you know, we, we all do this, like we make our list, or I don't know if everyone does this, Carl, you probably don't, um, but I do. I make my list, right? I've got a list. I, I you know, I've got my list today. Look at this. I've got one, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah. I've got this list, you know, and invariably, what do I do? The first thing I do is I try to cross off the easiest things first, right? Right. That makes me feel good. I crossed one off. I put a line through something, right? And oftentimes the easiest thing to do isn't the one that's going to have the biggest impact. Right? Right. And, and the harder things to do, I don't start them because I know I'm going to need four uninter uninterrupted hours. I'm going to need two uninterrupted days in order to really do that thing. Whereas maybe two hours, I could get 80% of it done and would actually make an impact on the business. You know, but to go from 80% to 100%, sometimes it's going to take 10 times the amount of time, right? It's the difference of writing a document versus creating an application. You know, it's, it's the difference between having a meeting and communicating an idea versus writing a 10-page process document, you know? Um, and so, I mean, I get hung up there a lot. So how do, how do people avoid that? How do you break out of that? Right. It... I find it, it's really a habit. Like you say, you know, I've got my checklists and I tend to go for the easiest thing. You know, it's just, how do I change, you know, my, you know, fear, if you will, of not being perfect. And that can come from who knows where, all, all sorts of things. But, you know, if you're afraid of flying or public speaking, you know, you should go get on a plane or, go do a small talk and kind of get accustomed to it to try and make yourself more comfortable with that idea. And so if you're like, yeah, I get it that I should try and, you know, get things done instead of holding off till they're perfect, practice with something small. Try, you know, try that on something that doesn't feel like you're betting your career on it, you know. <laughs> you know, start with something you know, in your personal life, um, you know, I, I didn't exercise because I couldn't devote a whole hour to it. Well, maybe you did 10 minutes and you did some stretching and a couple, you know, push-ups or something, you know, right. you did 10 minutes, wasn't perfect, but you did it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, a lot of wisdom in that, in that whole idea. And I just know from, you know, working with entrepreneurs and business owners, you know, every day that, it's a, um, it's fairly common. Um, I, I, I see it all the time. Um, and, um, I think it's, it could be the, I think that's maybe one of those nuggets that, you know, every time I have one of these talks and we record one of these podcasts and we try to add some value, we try to give like one thing 
that that some you know B2B leader would take away and could actually make progress on. I would just I would encourage everyone listening to to really take that concept to heart and really think about, you know, is there a project on your desk uh, or in your mind or in your notes that you know would have a big impact on the business, but you just haven't started it because you don't think you can dedicate the time to make it perfect. Just think about like what what would a baby step be? What would be an incremental step that you can move in that direction that will create a little bit of momentum um, and and will get the ball rolling? And then you can circle back in a week, a month, a year, and take try to move it to the next stage. You know whatever is appropriate for the scope of the project. Uh, I think that's a really really solid takeaway for folks. Um, I, I, there's one other thing I want, really want to ask you about um, before we wrap up, and because I just think it's really fascinating. So you're a turnaround certified turnaround analyst, right? So talk a little bit about what that means, and then I, I'm curious how that training or experience has impacted what you bring to customers today, who are mm -hmm. not necessarily in turnaround mode, but are just in make my business better mode. Right. right. My experience is kind of a lot of my career has been helping companies grow. And if you grow, you know, double in two years, you know, I've been through that a number of times in my career. Well, what does that look like? Well, when you grow quickly, usually cash flows tight because your customers pay you after you're paying your people and your vendors. Things are changing quickly. You're hiring people. You have to make decisions. So it's stressful. So, you know, you, you've got to, you know, managing cash, stressful, fast. Okay. Now, what's a turnaround look like? Well, man, cash flow is tight because, you know, sales are down. And so we've got to make a lot of decisions about people and overhead because, you know, we're going to make, get back to where we're profitable. You know, so we got to make these decisions, man, that's stressful. It's like, well, it actually sounds a lot like rapid growth. So the, the situations aren't terribly different. You know, um, you know, I've got a systems background, but also, you know, a lot of financial um, background in there and dealing with change. So those, all those themes are applicable to both situations. The interesting thing about the, like the training for the, the turnarounds you know, you're looking at how do we, you know, kind of quickly make the economics so that we're generating cash flow. We're looking at the value of the company. What's the current value of the company? And if we make these changes, what's the value of the company going to be? Of course, the this turnaround training also includes, you know, information about you know, if you're operating like in a bankruptcy type environment, what are those rules? And, you know, whether you're about to go into it, whether you're into it, or how do you come out of it? So there's a certain amount of kind of legal and procedural, you know, education there. But then, you know, it's also just about, you know, one of the biggest challenges with the turnaround, in my mind, really aren't necessarily the economics of the cash flow or the administrative part but it's the people you know you've got you know <laughs> when you're making changes you've got to communicate that effectively so that the people who are still there you know well, one stay there and two you know aren't just frozen with fear so there's a lot of communication going on there so those are those are some of the things that you know come up with both rapid growth and uh, turnaround situations. I, I'd never considered that. That's really interesting. Um, I, I, I'd i never actually seen, and maybe this is just me being unaware, but I'd never actually seen a certified turnaround analyst. So that was, uh, that was a really, really cool thing. Uh, when I read that, I was like, I need to know more about that. All right. So I, I said this last thing, but I, you just prompted one other question that I'm just curious about. So in your because you were talking about having to make tough decisions and bringing on people or, or, or figuring out who needs to stay in the case of a turnaround. Um, you know, as a, as a operations expert and a consultant, you've, um, you know, with experience in a bunch of different industries, you've, you know, I'm sure you've been involved in hiring um, some of those operational leaders, you know, either to replace you as a consultant or 
to help you or to supplement, you know, or to add to your team. I'm curious because there's probably people listening to this right now going, this all is great. Like I definitely know we need to improve our operations, but man, I'm just not the guy to do it. I, I think I need to get someone in here who thinks that way and can help me with that. Um, the, um, so I, I'm curious, and I'll put you on the spot here. Is there a killer question? Is there, is, there, is there a question that you tend to always ask when you're talking to those types of candidates for those types of roles? Is there something you really want to know that you find is just across the board, they got to meet this thing uh, or, or they're just a, it's a non-starter for me? Right. Um, actually, you know, for me, it's kind of the opposite. When I'm hiring, you know, what I find is that any one question or the resume or any one thing can be misleading, you know, and if I focus too much on one thing, you know, that can be a problem. Um, at one point in my career, I worked with a company, we were uh, working with like uh, mining and oil and gas companies overseas, helping, you know, keep their workers safe from malaria. And what we found is, you know, there's like five different things we could do, you know, in terms of, you know, take pills, you know, uh, bed nets, this and that, you know, and any one of them was, they had a little impact. But if we put the, you know, like 2%, but if we put all five in place and the people actually found that and we did all five, we'd have a huge, we'd have like a 50% drop in the malaria rates. And so, you know, 50%, 50%, 50%, you know, it's like, wow, that's massive. And what I find in hiring is the same type of thing. If, you know, if all I do is look at the resume or if all I do is focus on the interview, you know, I get, eh, you know, in the end, I, you know, when I see companies with 25%, 30% of hiring effectiveness, you know, the people really, really last. But if you, you know, if you do, you know, the, you know, the initial screening and the uh, multiple interviews and, re you know, reference checks and personality texts and, and assessments, and you do a really comprehensive approach, then I see the success rates in hiring, you know, skyrocket up to, you know, 70 and 80%. So that's what I actually see is the, the you know, so it's not, unfortunately, not one question in my experience. <laughs> I was hoping I could cut my interviews to 15 minutes, ask one question, be be done, right? So, uh, so there's that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. well, look, thanks so much, uh, Carl. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to share your expertise and your insight with us. Um, so, uh, let's see, what's the best way for uh, folks to get in touch with you if they want to learn more about? Um, you and your services are abundant as a software platform. Um, what's the best way to reach people, for people to reach you? Right. Um, well, you can always email carl at abundant.com, look up abundant.com on the internet or find uh, myself or abundant on LinkedIn. Be great ways to do it. Great, great. I know you're really active on LinkedIn. So that's a, that's a great pace, place people should should definitely look you up there and follow you because you're offer, always offering really uh, interesting insight. Um, well, thank you uh, again. Uh, of course, I'll have uh, all of Carl's contact information included in the notes uh, posted at prosalesconnection.com uh, under our podcast. So you can find more information about, uh, about him there if uh, you're driving or moving around and not able to make a note. Uh, that's a good way to find him. Um, look, if you liked our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you could give us a five-star rating on uh, iTunes. Uh, it's really helpful. Just taking a few seconds there has a huge impact on people being able to uh, find us and for us to be able to reach more people. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. And remember, B2B leaders grow companies faster when they focus on the big three. Have a great day. Pro Sales Connection is a sales and marketing firm that has been helping B2B companies grow faster since 2009. Learn more about our proprietary fastest path to revenue process for B2B companies. Experiencing the possibilities begins with a short 15-minute call. Schedule yours at www.prosalesconnection.com and click Get Started.